This week on Big Red's Cooking, a Moose Meat Big Mac. Welcome back to Big Red's Cooking. As always, I'm Big Red. You know, so this week what I'm going to do, you know, one of the, what turned out to be one of my most popular videos recently was when I did a copycat Mary Brown's. So I thought I'd do a copycat Big Mac, but I'm taking it up one more step. I've actually got some moose meat pulled out of the freezer. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to show you guys how to do a good ground moose in terms of talk about the ratios of fat to meat to get a really good hamburger patty that's going to give you something nice and juicy and tasty. You know, now, not everybody enjoys moose meat. Not everybody's got meat in their freezer. And there's no reason why you can't do this with ground beef if that's what you prefer. Ground turkey if you want. Ground chicken. Uh, I remember a few years back, I was actually teaching a marketing course and discovered that in India, where people are primarily the number of the more people are Hindu than anyone, and they don't eat beef, the cow is sacred to them. So you can actually get what's called a Maharaja Mac, which is made with chicken instead of beef. So you, know, you can go ahead and use any type of patty you want. I'm going to make this one with a moose patty, but feel free to substitute. Anyhow, that's enough from me talking. Why don't we jump on over to the bench and we'll pick up over there. All right, so to get our fries done, I've already got my potatoes here and what I've got are some nice starchy potatoes. So these specifically are russets, which are good sort of starchy or mealy potatoes, we call them in our kitchen. And what we're talking about, basically with our potatoes, we have starchy and we have our waxy potatoes, or mealy and waxy potatoes. Those waxy potatoes tend to be very high in sugar. As a result, they hold up really well when they cook. So that's the ones where you find in like soup that haven't fallen apart. They hold those shapes really well. Those are a or sorry, a waxy potato. We don't want that. They have a much higher sugar content and as a result they tend to burn in our deep fryers and get a lot of really dark streaks. We want that real classic french fry look. So I've got russets here. You know, so that's the one I would recommend. Like I say, or just look for something that says it's a good baking potato or even an all-purpose potato. You do not want a boiling potato. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to give my knife a... a quick pass on steel. It's always much safer to work with a good sharp knife. Uh, any obvious blemishes, you can go ahead and trim those away. Now, potato rolls around. You know, it's not always the safest thing to do. So what we want to do is take a slice off the outside right off the bat. And what we're aiming for is for the thickest part of that slice to be about the thickness that we want our french fries to be. So I'm going to go fairly thin on these. I'm trying to, you know, recreate that sort of McDonald's experience. So we don't want them too thick. I'm just going to go ahead and slice all my slices right on down through. And just put these to the side. I'll go ahead and do the same thing with this one. Take that outside edge off. So again, that I have that nice firm flat side. And now what I can do is I can take a few of these at a time. And just sort of slice right down through and get my french fries. And what we want to do is we want to get these put in the cold water. A couple of things. One, if we don't, you know, they're potato, they tend to oxidize. They'll turn brown on us if they're sitting outside the water for too long. But it's also going to help to remove some of the surface starch, which will ultimately give us a much better, you know, looking fry. That stuff will burn up and lead to some discoloration. Hey, Sam, how are you, puppers? Over to inspect to see what I'm doing. What? These guys don't need raw potato. Normally I'm pretty good about giving them little, you know, treats of whatever it is I've been cooking. But not today. So there we have it. And there's our french fries all cut. And got them in nice cold water. We can already see some of that starch that's coming out in the water here itself. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ha go ahead and put these into the fridge and let them sit in the fridge for about an hour or so and then we're going to drain them and we're going to do our first fry on these. So we're actually going to fry these twice. Our first fry will be at 250 degrees Fahrenheit and what that's going to allow us to do is to eliminate a lot of the moisture and water content and cook our fry without really developing much color to it. And then just before you know our burger is finished cooking, we're going to drop these back down into the hot fat again and finish cooking them. Get that nice really crispy outside and get that color onto them. So we'll see you guys in a little while. So our fries have had some time to sit in the fridge here now. And I've got them well drained, but I want to make sure I get as little splashing as possible. You know, anytime we put anything wet into hot oil, we can, we're going to get some moisture evaporation. And I don't want to be causing my oil to bubble up too much. So I tend to just give a little bit of a wipe, you know, just a piece of paper towel or you're going to use a dish rag if you've got a clean tea towel or something, anything like that of the sort will help to cut down the amount of moisture. And so I've got my fat. It's right now, it's about 280 degrees Fahrenheit. Ideally what I want is about 250, but I know what's going to happen. That's why I've got my heat on super low right now. And I was adjust my heat up. When I add this into my fat, it's going to drop that temperature down. You know, so what we want to do, and I'm going to get this put in here first. I'll talk about it a little bit once I get this going. Stealing a piece of potato, are you, Tala? Yeah, so that temperature is dropping really, really fast, which is perfect. That's why I started with that little bit of a higher temperature, so that I had that ability for it to come down, and I'll end up closer to the temperature I actually want it to, to be at. So as I was saying, what we want to do with our first fry, we want to do it at about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you'll notice I've got my candy thermometer in there. I would actually strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you do not do what I'm doing. I'm a professional. I've got my, you can see I've got my fire extinguisher handy there. I'm very capable at this. I'm very familiar with what I'm doing. You know, so really if you are doing deep frying at home, you should use a proper countertop deep fryer. I had one. I didn't like the way it worked. I'm going to purchase another one as I do more videos. But for the time being, I'm comfortable doing it like this. But what we're looking to do is we're looking to try and cook these without actually getting much coloration going. And that's how we get that really nice crispy fry. Right, so really what these are going to end up with, when they come out of here, they'll be very similar to what you would get when you purchase a frozen french fry. You'll notice that frozen french fry, it's actually, you know, it's about 80% cooked. This is what we refer to as blanching in a kitchen or par cooking. You know, and then you finish it in the oven or in your fat like this at a much higher temperature. That gets that color onto it. That gets that crispiness onto it. And so you'll be wanting to move these around. And that way you can make sure that none of your french fries are sticking together. You want to make sure they're not sticking to the bottom, things like that. So they cook nice and evenly. Okay, so these have been in here for, I'll say, five, six minutes now. I'll be honest, I didn't quite pay close attention to the time. But what I'm noticing is that a lot of them are starting to float to the top. And that gives me a good indicator that they're done. But I can actually see a cut, one or two of them have a little bit of color there, probably stuck to the bottom. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just take these out. And I've got my nice cooling rack here. And I'm just going to put them right on top of that. And I've got my cooling rack right on top of a sheet pan. And it's going to allow any of the excess oil to drain off. I don't want these getting soggy. 
I want these to be able to drain off and to cool down. Now we could at this point take these actually once they're cooled and freeze them if we wanted to and use them at a later date or you could take them, cool them, throw them into your fridge. You could actually do this a day or two ahead of time you know, just as a way to try and speed up a little bit of time so that when you go to cook them you know they're good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put these at my pantry which is nice and cold and allow them to cool down. I'll turn that off for now and uh, we'll pick up again now in a little while. So of course if we're going to have a burger we got to have meat. Now you're welcome to use ground meat from the store if you want to make that you know using beef and that's usually what I do. But I've got a bit of moose meat here so that's what I'm going to go ahead and use. First thing I'm going to do is turn on my scale because I want to be able to weigh this meat. Now when you're buying ground meat in the store you, know, you get your different lean, lean, medium, regular grind. Personally for a burger I think regular grind is where to go. You're usually looking at about 22 to 24 percent fat uh, maximum is 24% in Canada for a regular grind and that's what gives you that really nice sort of juicy burger. Now moose here is really lean which is why I want to weigh it because I'm going to end up at I'm going to end up adding some fat into this. So I want to see how much I, meat I actually have here so I know exactly how much fat to add in so I can get that correct proportion. Right, so I've got just shy of 300 grams of meat here. So if we're going for that 20 to 25 percent fat, what I'm looking at now then is about Mm, let's see, 20 times 60. I'm going to say 75 grams is what I'm going to want to add in. So, I think I got some salt pork. I think salt pork is the way to go because it's going to give us the fat that we're looking for. And it's going to give us a little bit of salt at the same time. So that's not going to be enough. But what I want to do is I'm going to trim off the rind from it. I just want the fat. I did bad math. I just shy 300 grams there. So at 22 grams each, we're going to say 60 grams is what I'm going to add. And that looks pretty good to me. Go ahead and put this away. And what we want to be able to do is we want to grind all this at the same time. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to put, you know, create some small chunks with my salt fat. So I can take that and throw that in while I'm grinding out my meat itself. Now the trick to getting a good grind is what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to cube it up. Oh, dog wants to come inside. Come on. Come on. So yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this meat, I'm going to cube it up. And I'm actually going to put it into the freezer 15-20 minutes and what I want it to do I don't want it to be frozen but I do want some ice crystals starting to develop into it. Now that little bit of silver skin that's on the outside if I was doing a fry or something like that I'd take that off but since I'm grinding this down not even going to worry about it. I'm going to watch out for scattered moose hair my dogs love raw moose, but they're not getting any of this today. So 
So there you go. We'll go ahead, we'll throw this into the freezer for about 15-20 minutes so we can get a little bit of ice starting to develop into it without it being completely frozen and it's going to give us a much better ground meat. Alright, we'll see you soon. So while our meat's in the freezer, I thought I'd go ahead and get a little bit more of my prep work done. So, you know, anyone who's watched my videos before, you've heard me talk about that word mise en place, or that phrase mise en place, which we use in kitchens to talk about all the things that we're going to need to prepare a meal. And that can be anything from our tools to, you know, the different food products that we're going to use, stuff like that. So I thought I'd go ahead and get some of this stuff done now so that later once I'm cooking my burgers and I'm ready to pull everything together, I don't have to go scrambling. I'll actually have everything I need good to go. So of course, you now we're doing a Big Mac, we're going to need some diced up onion. Now I do have a video that demonstrates on how to do this. And if you haven't watched that one, it's worth having a look at it. So this is just some plain white onion. And I get my nice little ramekins here. Put my onion in that. Now I've got a the inside part of a uh, head of romaine here, which I think is perfect for me for my taste, because we do need some shredded lettuce. Basically, I'm just you know, slicing this nice and thin. I want those nice ribbons of lettuce to be able to put onto that burger. You know, now, if you want to get really legit, you know, you can go out and grab yourself a head of iceberg. But you know what? I had this. I end up giving the rest of that to the dogs now in a moment. And that's going to do me just perfectly fine. I don't tend to buy a whole lot of iceberg lettuce. I much prefer the romaine anyhow. Yeah, that's it. Good girl, saying it. Good boy. There you go. They get their little treat. So, of course, if we're going to have a Big Mac, we're going to have Big Mac sauce. Now, you'll find all kinds of different recipes online. And I'm sure there are other ones that will taste more authentic than what mine will. But listen, at the end of the day, as long as we're happy, does it really matter all that much? I don't think so. So I like to keep it simple, keep it with ingredients that people, most people have on hand. So some ketchup, some must, or sorry, some ketchup, some relish, and some mayonnaise. And just go ahead and get that little swirl around. And you can go ahead and give it a little taste. See if it tastes the way you want it to taste. Now you'll see a lot of recipes add a little bit of vinegar into this. To me personally, it gets a little bit too thin. You know, uh, I've seen other ones where they've got paprika and garlic powder and all kinds of stuff into it. And you're welcome to do that. You know what? You're the one that's cooking this. You're the one that's eating this. When doing a burger, I like simplicity. Hmm? Tastes good to me. So there you go. We have our Big Mac sauce. Now, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pop these into the fridge. Particularly the Big Mac sauce because I don't want that spoiling them while we're waiting. So we've got our meat here. It's, you know, it's starting to get frozen now, especially the pieces along the edge. It's nice and cold, which is what I want. We can see it's getting a little bit firm. There's a bit of ice into it. Not a lot of ice. So it's not going to overstrain the grinder. I've got my bowl set up here. I'm actually using... A, a jug underneath it. So a bit of a lift. And of course, safety first. So what you're going to want to do when you're doing that again, you know, if you're using an electric grinder like I have, make sure you're using your safety tools. And make sure you're putting those pieces of pork in, so 
you know, so you can try and get a nice equal distribution, if you can, through your meat. So our meat's all done. I'm going to go ahead and put this right into the cooler because I want to be able to clean up my tools before I go shaping up my patties. So I'm just going to put this into the fridge for a few minutes and we'll pick back up once I get this grounder cleaned up. Okay, so I'm going to use a scale here because I want to get decent size on my patties here. So what we're actually going to be looking for is about 100 grams or about three ounces per patty. You know, those McDonald's patties tend to be pretty thin. Like I say, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use this ring mold. So I want to get those really nice, well defined, nicely shaped patties. And a little tip to you if you make them a little more shallow in the center so they sort of rise to the edge you'll end up with something that sits a little bit flatter now obviously if you don't have one of these at home you don't have a ring mold like that you just go ahead and shape them however you want and they don't need to have that perfectly round shape and these are definitely not going to finish with that perfectly round shape so i'm going to go ahead and get this cast iron pan turned on i need that I nice and hot i want like that Gets almost smoking hot, so we get a really good sear on these. So you'll notice I do have my fat on over here. I'm bringing that up in temperature. I'm going to be aiming for about a 350 degree temperature on that. Once I get close, I'm going to drop my temperature down. Again, if you've got a deep fryer, perfect, then you don't have to worry about it. What we're looking for is a finishing, a cooking temperature now of about 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So what we're going to do is we're going to aim to actually put our fries into the oil just as our hamburger patties are finished cooking. And what that allows me to do is have the time to assemble my burger while my fries are cooking. And then I can pop that, those fries out and just throw them on the plate right at the last minute. Alright, so I can see my pan is getting nice and sizzling hot here now. So I can go ahead and put these on. You can hear that sizzle as they hit that pan. And of course, anytime I'm dealing with raw meat, immediately afterwards, you'll notice I have plastic wrapped down. You know, I didn't want to be getting any raw meat on my wooden cutting board. And I immediately wash my whole area down right away. So while our patty is cooking, it's a good time now to pull out all of our stuff we're gonna to need to be able to finalize the assembly here. Now, of course, these are not going to need any salt. They've got all that salt fat into them. But I'm definitely a pepper lover. Now, you know, obviously you can mix up your hamburger meat however you like. My recommendation, use a nice regular grind, salt and pepper, and nothing more. You know, most people I find tend to overcomplicate their hamburgers. The trick to it is just make sure you pack it really good and tight so it holds together. And then once you put it in that hot pan, just leave it be. There's no need to be flipping it all over the place, left, right, and center. Let it cook. You'll get that nice crust on the outside of it. I'll turn my pan down just a little. And then we'll flip it over and we'll get that nice crust on the outside. You don't need to go squeezing these things down. And what you actually want to do, and I'm starting to see it now, is you'll see little droplets of blood starting to form on the top. And that's what we want to be able to see. When we start seeing, seeing a little bit of that liquid pool on the top, we know that that's a good time to be flipping over our hamburger. Use those visual cues. You know, and then we don't have to worry about screwing it up at all. And you can see we got that lovely nice brown crust. Not burned by any means. 
And again, a little bit extra pepper. You know, so just let it do its thing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start getting, I'm going to grab some buns. So I've just got some good old fashioned, you know, sesame seed bun, which is the classic for the Big Mac. Now, of course, we need that extra layer. Now what I like to do, just to get really crazy with it, is I'll very carefully just remove that little bit of crust from the bottom of the bun. Now if I was using the top of the bun, I basically I would do the same thing so I get rid of those sesame seeds so I get that proper inside bun. I'm going to go over and give these a little bit of a toast. So I can see again some of that liquid starting to pool at top of my hamburger. So I know my patties are just about ready. My buns are actually in the toaster already. So I'm going to go ahead and my fat is nice and hot. So I'm going to go ahead and add my fries in there now. So again, so with those french fries, we've got that oil at about 350 degrees Fahrenheit right now. And of course, I, you know, as always, it's dropped down in temperature a little bit. Oh, my bun is done. So we can go ahead and start assembling this here now. So of course, add that Big Mac sauce on the bottom. I'm going to give these one last flip. That way any of that juice has pooled. And I actually turn this pan off right now. And we get a little bit of onion. Or in my case, a lot of onion because I love it. Here's one of our patties. We gotta get cheese slice on there. Now this is about the only thing I'll actually ever purchase a cheese slice for. I don't normally eat these things. There's something about a Big Mac that requires it. So we get our second layer. We get a bit more Mac sauce. We need Mac sauce on top. We got our second patty on there. Cheese, and of course, gotta have a few pickles. Now, again, I love pickles, so I'm adding a couple extra, and these are actually my own homemade pickles that I made. And we gotta get our lettuce. Now, I find it much easier to put it on top and then cap it off. rather than trying to flip that over. And there's our Big Mac. Our fries are just about ready to go. All right, so I think our fries are good to go here now. So I'll pull these out. Give them a little shake. Of course, I think it's important to salt those fries as soon as they come out. Give them a little toss. Our salt gets all nice and even all over. You can hear that sort of beautiful sound. So go ahead and put those on our plate. And there we go. So you know what? Let's shift on over to our main counter over here. And we're going to give this a taste. Oh, this looks so good. So doesn't that look fantastic? Mmm, smells good. 
fry is just like a McDonald's fry. But really, it's all about the burger, isn't it? I'm going to get that little squeeze down. You know, my, I know my mouth is big, but it's not that big. <laughs> Mmm. That's just fantastic. So there you go. There's how you can make a big moose burger for yourself at home. You know, now if you want to just make it as a big Mac, go ahead. Go play that ground meat for yourself. Yeah, you know, but if you want to step it up, make it a little bit more adventurous. You know, draw it on some of that Aboriginal roots. And even if you're not, just for people here in Newfoundland. You know, everyone's eating lots of moose, but nobody ever knows what to do with it. So there you go, make yourself a Big Mac with it. You know, take the time, cut those ha fries yourself instead of just buying a bag of frozen french fries. There really isn't that much to it. This is something that anybody, anyone you guys can do. So as always, I hope you have enjoyed this video. I hope you learned a little bit something from it. Uh, and I really do hope you're gonna go ahead and share it, pass it around, recommend me. If you haven't actually subscribed to the channel yet, please do so. Uh, keep tuning back. I got some more videos coming up soon. Uh, you know, a wide range of things. I'm going to get some baking soon, I think, actually. Uh, but keep eating some good food. Bye for now. <music>